Well, good Tuesday morning, friends. Mark Holmes here, of course, with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. Without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. Man, it has been a crazy, crazy offseason. And um, let me get you guys an updated list here. And, you know, we, we're here about trying to be solutions-based um, as a Cowboy fan. We all know I am a diehard Dallas Cowboy fan. I make no bones about it that I like Dak Prescott. I think he's the best option for the Cowboys. But the reality is, is there's something wrong with the way Cowboys are doing business, okay? We continue to do the exact same thing year after year. We end up being disappointed. We end up finding out we don't have enough firepower. And then we go back to our ways of we're not going to try and bring in anybody extra. It's up through free agency, bottom tier, and through the draft. Um, and for the most part, in comparison to a lot of teams, you can say, Last year's draft class didn't work out as well as you like, but let's be honest with you. A couple of factors in there. Because you're successful, that means you're going to pick later in the draft. And the Cowboys, they took some swings, and maybe they mismanaged some of the players that they had. One of the things that I say that I don't like about the Dallas Cowboys is they constantly look for discounts. They'll look at a guy who's got injuries, you know, and I find it, find it funny now because the Michael Penix, the Cowboys should draft Michael Penix uh, late in the first round, or excuse me, actually some people say we have to move up to get him. A guy who's had season injuring injuries four times, that of course would be the ideal pick for the Cowboys because you got a guy who, had he not had all these injuries, that would have been in the top, say, five or so. But has had those, and we've had a bad history with guys that were injured. They, not to say that they couldn't play, but your best ability is your availability. And as we go through, I want to put up here the uh, cap space as it's currently sits right now. New England still got forty six million. The Commanders still have forty three. Titans thirty nine. Texans thirty one. Eagles surprisingly with thirty one. Um Chargers with thirty. Cardinals with twenty nine. Lions with twenty six. Raiders with twenty four. Bengals with twenty three. Bears with twenty two. Packers with twenty one. Broncos, you know, seventeen with, you know, saying bye to Russell Wilson, Colts at 16, Vikings at 16, Rams at 14, Steelers at 14, Jaguars 12, Ravens at 12, uh, Panthers at 8, Saints at 8, the Bills at 7, the Giants at 7, the 49ers at 6, uh, right there with us at 6, 7. So, clearly... Something is not quite right with how they're doing business. For the Cowboys, not spending money on free agency, yet has some of the least amount of money on their team. You can look at the Chiefs and say they're usually not a big player per se in free agency early on, but they do make a lot of different moves. They make trades and stuff. And so I was listening to Rich Eisen uh, with Albert Breer um, this morning, and it kind of struck a chord with me because I think the problem with the Cowboys is is they believe in their guys too much. The thing is, is they look at it and they say, we drafted this guy, we want this guy to be a Cowboy for life, or we hold on to them so long that they kind of break down. In some regards, that may be part of the problem. And this could go for even for Dak. For some people, this is where the crux of this goes, where they're looking and saying that maybe 
paying the big money on the quarterback situation. Of course, they're saying that now because of, you know, Dak after Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson and, you know, all those guys, uh, you know, uh, Justin Herbert got theirs. Now, of course, when it's Dak's turn to get paid, of course, then it's always, you know, there should be a change here. We shouldn't pay him. That's the same narrative that we had before when Dak Prescott was getting paid. And then it disappeared, you know, because it was forty million. Then all of a sudden, everybody was forty million plus, you know. And then it was fifty-five. We didn't hear any of that last year, when you know everybody got paid. The fifties became in vogue, um, but now there's revisionist history. But if we look across the board and we think about some of the contracts that we've made, would the Cowboys have been better off saying, you know what, we're going to let them go and we'll go into free agency? For example. When you think about Michael Gallup's contract, they said, you know, we drafted Michael Gallup in the third round. He's been good for us and stuff, even though his numbers were dropping off. After a sophomore season of being 1,100 yards, his next year was like eight-something. Then the next year it was four-something and kind of injury-riddled. And then it was, let's go ahead and pay him $11 million. They valued him too much because – they could have gone out in free agency and got a guy, similar numbers. In fact, you could dare say, had they kept Cedric Wilson, who was only $7 million, I think, when he went to Miami, they would have been better suited having a healthy Cedric Wilson than a Michael Gallup that was $11 million per year that you restructured coming back from injury. And you can look at this from the standpoint of Here's where that was definitely a no-win right there. But then you look at a situation like Dalton Schultz. Nobody would have said that they would have been stupid to have gotten a deal done with Dalton Schultz. They actually tried. They Basically, the deal he ended up getting with the Texans was the deal that the Cowboys offered him, and he kind of balked at it. So you let him go and not incur that $12 million a year. You've got Jake Ferguson who is now going into his third year. You're going to have to pay him after this year or into next year and so on. But that's that money that you didn't spend on them. And we can go down the line and say there's places where, you know, would the Cowboys have been better off not paying Demarcus Lawrence or using that money to bring in a couple free agents for a year or two and not being locked in? Because the other problem with it is is when you do – get these players and don't get me wrong some of these players micah parsons cd lamb and dak and so on you look at this and say they're top players in their position and you want those but the problem is is your roster is so top heavy with that talent that you're not able to continue to keep talent across the board so when you have a tyron smith who is best in the business when healthy, but gets injured, what you drop down to is a Chaz Green. Or you drop down to an undrafted rookie free agent who's never started before in their life. Or you have to go out and you get a 40-year-old Jason Peters who can only play 15 plays in a game. And herein lies the problem of your success becomes your downfall. You're successful in drafting your guys, and you say, we were so good at getting that guy, we got to get keep him. Instead of saying, maybe that's a guy I can trade before they go downhill and get something back in return. Or they go out in free agency, and you end up getting a comp pip back. And see, this is here where we constantly have big salary guys that their waning years are not productive. They're a big salary hit that year, and then it carries on. Zeke Elliott is a case in point. So Zeke was overpaid, and we paid so much for him every year. Even when he was gone, he still cost us $6 million last year, and he's cost us another $6 million this year. And maybe there is something to the Cowboys not signing and holding on to some of the guys. 
Because we always say, well, you know, we don't want that guy to go somewhere. He's going to haunt us. He's going to haunt us, man. He's going to come back. And I, you know what? That's across the NFL. It's a business. And for the players, it's about getting paid. For the team, it's about winning. And those two things don't necessarily go together with being a long-term or a cowboy for life. Let's listen into this one from Rich Eisen because this is, this is actually very, very interesting when you listen to it. The rise of price of quarterbacks, right? And where you're seeing Joe Burrow go now and Justin Herbert go now and Jalen Hurts go now. I had more discussions with people about the idea of churning that position than ever before. And I think part of it is you see some of the guys who are going to get paid, like Brock Purdy, for example, has had an unbelievable start to his career. Do you pay him $55 million a year? Or do you have the stomach to churn that position, right? Like, I think the Packers are going to pay Jordan Love, but would you consider churning that position? Mm. It's... I think it's a fast that and that discussion first came up for me, Rich. I would say 12 years ago, right? Um, when after the the Seahawks had drafted Russell Wilson, well, less than 12 years ago, he was drafted 12 years ago, so it would have been seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. But it was like when they were first looking at paying Russell Wilson, and they had all of those mouths to feed, right? Like Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas and Bobby Wagner and Cam Chancellor, and I don't need to go down all the names of all the Hall of Fame types that were in that building, right? And like there was this whole thing, like could John Schneider, who came from Green Bay, hey, where where Ron Wolf would draft a quarterback every year, and had mm -hmm. Matt Hasselbeck and Mark Brunel and Aaron Brooks and all those guys behind Brett Favre for all those years, there would we go. some would John Schneider be the guy that would say, nope, I'm keeping everybody else, I'm going to draft another quarterback, and we're going to maybe tag Russell Wilson for a year and then let him go. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the Seahawks didn't wind up doing it, but I know there was that thought out there that they could. Does someone do it now? And it's, look, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Josh Allen, those guys, I'm not talking about those guys, right? No. Those guys will always get the money. But after a year in which Daniel Jones got $40 million a year and Baker Mayfield completely outplayed him at $10 million per, does there come a time when a team just says, you know what? We're going to find a way to just turn this position and we're going to turn it over year to year. That discussion I heard from, like, I just, I mean, just, I'm just talking about like discussions I had casually out at night and that sort of thing. That discussion you're hearing more and more now. So I don't know that we're on the doorstep of that starting to happen. And again, it won't affect the super elite. Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, all those guys are going to get theirs at the highest level. The question is if you have a guy that's a little less than that, are you comfortable paying him at that level? Or are you better off going back into the draft to, to find one so you constantly have that rookie contract advantage with your quarterback? Bert, we've been talking about that for years here. And, you know, the, the team that we identified that would m maybe do that first, again, treat the quarterback position like running back, wide receiver. Yeah. Why are we paying that when we could just go in the draft and draft another one? It's just such a crapshoot at quarterback and so important in terms of the position. Boy, is that a risk. So you need to have a coach. With tenure, you need to have a general manager with tenure and an owner who believes in both. And we always yep. identified the Ravens as being that team because of of, yep. uh, of that. But, you know, Lamar proved to be a velvet rope type quarterback, right, that you pay. That's the guy yeah. that we, we – so so take them out. And so uh, you're, you're identifying maybe San Francisco being that I mean, one. You I never know. No, I know, and you're just speculating. How about this one? How about this one? And then I'll let you go. And I appreciate you giving us all this time of your family waiting mm -hmm. for you to join them for Easter weekend. So uh, listen, how about this one? How about Dallas? Because the GM yeah. is the owner. And now you've got yeah. Dak. Here you, know, you go. Prove it deal now? Like what the hell is going on there? What about that is churning? If you're Dallas, the position? I mean, if you're Dallas, well, and, and remember Dallas has got to pay CD Lamb. They've got to pay Micah Parsons, right? right? How much is Micah Parsons going to cost? You know? A lot. Like so <laughs> So, I mean, it is, it is a thought like, and, and Minnesota got to that point, right? Like where it was, they love Kirk, like Kevin O'Connell loves Kirk cousins and would have them back in a sec in a second, if all things were equal, but they got to the point where it's like, we can't do this anymore. Where we're playing this game where the price keeps rising and you're fully guaranteed every year. Like we can't keep doing this. It's like, 
you know, we just we have to break the cycle at some point. Is Dallas at that point? Could Dallas consider again, like say they like Michael Penix more than some other teams? Could they consider Michael Penix at the end of the first round? You know, I I, I think these these discussions are interesting ones to have because. Mm-hmm. You know, especially with a team like, you know, against the uh, the Cowboys, right? They haven't been to the NFC title game. Forget winning a Super Bowl. They haven't been to the NFC title game since, what is it, 1995? Mm-hmm. And, and they have been paying at the top of the market at quarterback. Now, I'm not saying Dak's not a good player. He's a really good player. But does there come a point where you have to change the model? You know, I, I that that is one that's worth watching. And I, I, I can't help but think, you know, it's so funny. We, bring, we, we talked about Minnesota, right? One thing that I've brought up with the Minnesota people and I've talked to them over the last few weeks about Sam Darnold is how I I think I saw a little something. You remember the, the, the that Monday night, the Christmas night game between um, between the Ravens and Niners? Mm-hmm. And the Ravens blew them off the field, right? If you were watching the end of that game in the last 10 minutes, I think I saw a different Sam Darnold. Now, I don't know. I'm not a coach. I'm not a scout. <laughs> but that dude looked like he was playing a different game than he had previously. It looked like like he was playing faster right sure and in this, <laughs> in this in this day and age albert you know where you just mentioned mayfield outplayed um you know daniel jones last year oh, daniel jones uh, that was honestly ridiculous. why can't sam Darnold be the second ver- the, the new version of version mayfield of you know what i mean like right. with a new spot He's younger than him you know he that, was drafted right, right behind him same damn draft you know so He's- why not and in the same way, also though, as and, and he's from a, the organization where, you, where there's Purdy, and you're you're wondering if there's any churn at the position somewhere, and would the Niners dare to do that with Purdy? Um, you know, the, the the Niners churning the position, the one of the backups to Dak is Trey Lance, so yeah. he's sitting there, and and the Cowboys are have them in his him is in the back pocket, you know. I got a good I got a good story on that one for you. Like so, I. I remember being with Gino, right, or being with Gino in, in Seattle um, after last summer. I spent a good amount of time talking to him, and then, you know, um, and that was before practice, and we kind of gone through his story and how much he learned when he sat and all of that, like, and how humbling it was for him and everything else. And I was with one of his coaches walking off the field that afternoon, and this coach said to me, coaching Gino has made me wonder how many more Genos there are out there. How many more guys there are who always had talent, who were thrown out there too early on bad, bad teams, situations, who got knocked around, who were forced to sit down for four or five years, who still have that talent, where no one knows it because everybody's given up on them. But they've learned so much sitting for a few years, and they've learned so much from the experience of having gone through that. And it did, that really made me think. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it's you think of all the guys and how the league chews up these guys and spits them out. And how many guys are thrown into bad circumstances or play too early because the job, the coach's job's on the line, whatever it is, you know? And, like, how many guys are there out there like that? And the Bucks sort of found one in Baker Mayfield. And now maybe the Vikings have found one in Sam Darnold. I don't know. I mean, I think they're still going to draft one. But, you know, I, maybe they have something there in Sam, you know? And, and, and the thing is, like, they have him on a one-year deal at $10 bucks. Everybody knows it's going to get a hell of a lot more expensive if he plays really well. Mm-hmm. So there's just a lot of dynamics at work at that with that. And, you know, I, I do think, like, with the rate at which the league is chewing up and spitting out talented young quarterbacks who are drafted in the first round or two, um, there's got to be more opportunity, like the one Seattle found, like the one maybe Minnesota finds, like the one Tampa found. There's got to be more opportunities like they're out there, like that out there. Okay, so that's an interesting thought with the quarterback that maybe you should look and say that's not the guy. Um, I would have said that about Daniel Jones because I said Daniel Jones. Sorry, you know it was one playoff season that they had, and you know Saquon was a key member of that, and Saquon, of course, kind of tailed off at the end of that season, which is why. The team kind of tailed off more or so. Um, I have to agree with that on some of them because, see, the, the, the problem is, is this. As good as Baker Mayfield played last year, as good as he did, they had one victory over the Eagles that were failing. They weren't still a Super Bowl team. You can go through and say, yeah, maybe Sam Darnold turns it around, but 
you know, there's not a lot of track history that says it's that, that, that it's going to happen. And having gone from place after place after place after place, and now, of course, we've seen Carson Wentz has now been signed by Kansas City. Um, the thing is, is when you look at the difference of the elite quarterbacks, you're not seeing guys that are, you know, the Trent Dilfers these days that are going to the Super Bowls. You're not seeing those guys that are – deep into the playoffs I get the idea and the concept on that but you still need a above average quarterback I think to try and make that run um but who knows who knows what the answer is the thing with the Cowboys is they do spend a lot of money on their own players and shun anybody from the outside and as long as that roster is top heavy the problem is You can say that we've had enough talent to go all the way, but the problem is is you are so reliant on about eight guys on your roster when one of those guys get hurt or one of those guys get worn down, and Zeke is the perfect example of this. Zeke Elliott, by the time the season ended, wasn't the same guy that he was that started the season. The last two seasons that we had Zeke here, Midway through the season, he had a PCL injury, I believe it was, and a hyperextended knee. If you looked at the yards per carry average before these injuries, he's in the mid fours. Then you looked at him after those injuries, his numbers are in the threes. It averages out to like three, nine or whatever, but you need him the most when it comes playoff time. But because you're so reliant on him, at that position all year long that there's not much left in the tank. And here would be the philosophy of saying we don't necessarily have to have the greatest at every position. We need really good at all positions. And that way when you lose one, you've got somebody else that steps in that's not such a step off. It's an interesting conversation. Um, Maybe it is better for the Cowboys that Dak Prescott goes elsewhere and they look at starting all over. But the core problem with the Cowboys is they're putting too much reliance on too few players. If you bring in a quarterback now, whether it's Dak or anybody else, and have the running situation where you do like you did last year or you have the offensive line giving up 39 sacks and the running, uh, the defense not being able to stop the run, you're still not going to the Super Bowl. So you have to address those core issues of making sure you have more than enough talent all the way around. All right, good people. I got to get up to this farmhouse and get working. I got a wrench thrown at me yesterday with the uh, in-laws house having their water line coming into the house uh, leaking and having to dig that up outside and get that squared away. So I am behind on what I got to do. So I am going to roll on out of here as always. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Just some food for thought. And we're getting closer and closer to the draft that may be the most important draft that we've had in a long time. Peace out.